This panel session will focus on the foundation of the business versus the interests of the airport, or as we all know, the lease structure. Uh, the panel is going to discuss um, lease length, terms, obstacles, best practices when it comes to negotiating leases between airports and their tenant companies. We have three distinguished guests here. Our first speaker is James Coyne. He's a former U.S. representative from Pennsylvania, worked under the Reagan administration to bring private sector solutions to national challenges. In 1994, NATA selected Coyne as its president and CEO. Coyne serves on the board of Governors and Flight Safety Foundation and was the founder of the Air Charter Safety Foundation. Please welcome Jim Coyne. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and one thing you left out of that uh, introduction is that I'm also on an airport commission. So I, I have had one of the few people, I think, to really look at this issue of airport leases uh, from both sides. Uh, it is. Uh, let me uh, just uh, begin by saying it is a very, very important topic, an incredibly important topic today, much beyond the world of just aviation. Uh, I think in all of the fields of infrastructure today, highways, ports, airports, uh, mass transit, uh, most uh, observers have come to understand that our nation is going through a very dramatic change in terms of what the public governments can afford and how they can uh, uh, continue to uh, meet the expectations of the public uh, in the world of unprecedented deficits, uh, pressure for lower taxes, really concern about how we pay for the government we've got already. And I think one of the things that, we've, that many thoughtful people in government have come to realize is that if we are going to build the kind of infrastructure in America that we need, whether it's at airports or anywhere else, we're going to have to look more and more to the private sector to be the underwriters of those investments. Uh, certainly, if we expect the infrastructure that's there now to be improved, uh, most of us have come to realize that for a, a public entity to go out in today's world and try to ask for the, the voters to throw another hundreds of millions of dollars at a new highway or a new mass transit or whatever, more and more often the voters are going to say, where's the money going to come from? And so today, we, if we expect our infrastructure to improve, I think we're going to have to go back to the model of most of America's history, where the vast majority of American infrastructure has been financed and underwritten through the investments of, of private businesses. And if you look at the canals, you look at the railroads, you look at the early toll roads, the turnpikes, all of the investment across America, uh, time after time and t after time, you understand that it's really the genius of our private sector, the, the entrepreneurial spirit, the risk taking, and especially the ability to manage costs better than government can do that has allowed the private sector to be such an important part of our infrastructure investment. And one of the of course, the areas where this is most challenging, I suppose, is at, at the airport environment, where we do have, obviously, publicly owned airports uh, with public sponsors who are operating as a governmental entity. And yet we, in most cases, uh, at most airports around the country, we see a very significant expectation that the private sector will uh, be the, the spark that makes that airport grow and succeed. Now let me be first to say, and I'm sure everybody in this panel would agree, that every single airport is different. You've seen one airport, all you've seen is one airport. And so to expect a one-size-fits-all uh, strategy uh, for airports across America, frankly, just doesn't work. But one thing that is clear is that if we're going to create an environment where the private sector will go on to an airport and spend millions of dollars with a new facility, uh, especially for an FBO, for hangars, for uh, investments in uh, airside activity at that airport. Uh, you're going to have to make the terms of the lease such that that business can live with the terms of the lease and can go out and find financing to make sure that the economics works. And I think that's probably the two words that I would emphasize here more than anything else. Making the economics work. Uh, oftentimes it seems to me 
There are people on the public sector side, the airport sponsor side, never having been in the private sector, never having had to, to live with the realities of running a, a business and the uncertainties and the risks and, the, and the, uh, uh, the chances that you could have like we had in 2008 where traffic falls uh, 30 percent almost overnight or when costs increase dramatically uh, whether it's insurance costs or fuel costs or all of the uncertainties that businesses typically have to deal with. One of the uncertainties you don't want to add to that mix is an uncertainty about when your lease is going to be renewed and how you, whether you're even going to be in business at that airport once the lease is, is expires. So we working with investors, working with banks, other lending institutions have come to understand uh, what the needs are for businesses, for their lenders uh, in terms of leases at airports today. And I think frankly uh, more and more we've reached the conclusion that you absolutely have got to work with the airport to convince them that it's in everybody's benefit to have a long-term lease. A lease of comparable to what lenders uh, are willing to, to uh, expect when they're making a loan to a, a business. Um, now those of us who have been in real estate for a long time know that there are uh, you know, different parts of the world, we have very different uh, expectations. You go to England and you'll see 100-year uh, leases uh, as a relatively routine, uh, routine thing. Uh, you'll see some parts of the world where everything's got to be uh, uh, you know, almost year to year. But here in America, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to need uh, an environment that supports leases in the vicinity of, of 30 years, 25, 30, 40 years, so that those become the standard, so that we can go out and get the investments, that uh, raise the money and the capital to meet these needs. Uh, now, there are challenges to this. Uh, there are some airport sponsors who feel that somehow their hands are being tied because they have a, a long-term lease. Well, the lease can have clauses in it that allows for the airport sponsor to deal with un unforeseen chances, uh, unforeseen exceptions. But the fundamental issue is that the, the investor, the person that has put all this money in to the, his assets, expecting a long-term lease, has got to somehow be made whole so that somebody doesn't come along and say, well, now, here we gave you a, a lease of such and such a time and we're pulling the plug out on you after two years and, and tough. You know, we're just going to make you figure out how to keep afloat. Uh, we think that the lease negotiation has got to be essentially as though it were between two professional business people so that they understand as a business would, because that's what we're creating at that airport through the lease. We're creating a business. We're creating a business to serve the airport users. And let's be mindful again of the fundamental reason why we have airports in America today in the first place. We have airports to promote the economic well-being of its community. So, so that that airport can be a catalyst for improving the quality of life, for improving the economic well-being, the, the growth, the jobs, all of these other things that an airport acts as a catalyst for. And so that businesses at that airport are just like businesses anywhere else and they expect to deal with a landlord who is mindful of their business realities. And unfortunately we sometimes have situations at airports around the country where the airport has a very, very different agenda. I think this, the biggest failing in this equation has been the comment that was made in the last pa panel, communications. What was the famous line in some movie, what we have here is a failure to communicate? Uh, this, this is, in fact, should be carved in stone over, the, over every airport meeting room that exists today. I'm amazed as an airport commissioner, having been on the commission for three years, how little communications takes place between the public, the airport tenants, and the commissioners. They act as though it's somehow, you know, there's a wall. You cannot go beyond that wall and talk to the members of the commission or talk even to the airport management in an effective way. And so we have got to, as a, as a community, especially those businesses, become much more proactive in making sure that the airport management, the airport commissioners, the other political sponsors of the airport are keenly aware of why that airport exists in the first place, to promote the economic development and jobs and how they've got to think as, a, as an effective business a partner to that success. 
Uh, we're working, of course, uh, across the country with airport associations, ACI, AAAE, and others to foster communications at our level between the different trade associations. And I'm really pleased to say that over the last six months, uh, there's probably been more communications in the, at this level of the associations going on between the airport representatives, their associations, and those that represent the aviation businesses there uh, than there's been in a long, long time. So I hope that this process of more communication is going to help educate and bring some best practices to the, to the equation. We do recognize, though, that every airport is different. You were talking in the last panel about, uh, about Key West. I mean, you can compare Key West and its footprint with DIA, which is about the size of Rhode Island, I think, or just about the District of Columbia. Uh, you could not get two more different airports in terms of real estate, in terms of footprint, in terms of land, in terms of the amount of airside uh, runway uh, access. Here in Las Vegas, we have, a, again, a very, very unique airport uh, with a very unique uh, resident, I mean, excuse me, uh, real estate realities there. And so we have to recognize that there are very, very differences. But first and foremost, the airports have got to recognize that we as businesses have to be able to go out and borrow the money with banks who look at us as though we're part of the Soviet Union. I mean, they really do. They say, tack air? You mean you don't own your, your facility? You mean you don't have, it's not your business on your land? It's, we're lending money to you and, and, and somebody new could be elected in your town or county and all of a sudden you're going to be thrown up for, out to the wolves? And a bank hears all of that and the bank says, well, you know, this is really a different world. Let's, uh, let's start to, and so we've got to be able to convince our airports to be cooperative, understand our long-term leases, the need for long-term leases, and work with, with us to make it happen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, great perspective there. Uh, next speaker is Michael Hodges. He is president and founder of Tampa-based Airport Business Solutions, uh, a company which specializes in airport tenant uh, relations and has more than two decades of experience representing airports and tenant businesses. Please welcome Michael Hodges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've spent a lot of my time, uh, I've been in this industry now for about 24 years and and the, the vast majority of my time has de been dealing with with lease and property issues. So when I was asked to be on this panel, it was it was kind of an easy topic for me to uh, to address. And um, yeah, I, I've spent uh, a lot of my time working for both airports and and private businesses and helping each side understand kind of where the other side's coming from and the challenges that that each each face. And I think when it comes to leases, I think that's that's really one of the one of the uh, shortcomings and what causes a lot of problems that are that are out there and you know the importance of a lease is that and really the, the greatest challenge is that a lease has to be a win-win scenario for both parties and I, that's really what creates a lot of the problems is is that both sides need to to have some type of economic benefit from the terms of a lease but everybody has their own uh, objectives and and goals from a uh, from that uh, negotiation process so it really does create uh, a problem but I think that, you know as I go through this I'll explain that ultimately it comes down to creating a win-win scenario for both parties in a lease negotiation you know obviously one of the uh, what Jim talked about uh, lease terms. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I want to start out talking about rent because that's really kind of what everybody focuses on first and foremost. Is you know what's it going to cost me? If if you're the tenant, what's it going to cost me at the airport? If you're the airport, it's what are you going to give me? So I think it's important to start out by talking about about rent, and I start out by giving you a definition. I think it's a, a very important definition from the standpoint of of lease negotiation. It's the definition of market rent. And I was going to read it to you. It's the most probable rent that a property should bring in a competitive and open market, reflecting all conditions and restrictions of the lease agreement, 
including permitted uses, use restrictions, expense obligations, term, concessions, renewal and purchase options, and tenant improvements. That is the definition of market rent from the Dictionary of Real Estate Appraisal. I think that, that definition and the, the misunderstanding of that, of that term is, is what creates a lot of the problems in, in lease negotiations for airport properties because the difference in, of, of an airport property versus off airport, there are so many things that have to be taken into consideration and most of them fall within the purview of this definition. You know, the impact of the lease term, the impact of the, the use restrictions that an aviation a property owner has to be is limited to aeronautical use. Um, the, the capital improvement requirements, the requirements to adhere to minimum standards, all of those things have to be taken in consideration when, when, when uh, rents are being set. And that's a reason, that's a, a really a valid reason why when airports and this happens more often than not, try to look at what's going on off airport in setting the rates on the airport without considering all of these use restrictions and these limitations that are imposed on a, uh, an aviation property. Another issue is that is dealing with the FAA. The FAA's talks about, and when it comes to rent, it talks about for aeronautical properties, fair and reasonable. Now, it doesn't say market, market value or market rent except for non-aeronautical properties. And that's a kind of a misunderstood uh, issue within, within the industry. And, you know, fair and reasonable, but the problem that comes into that is that, you know, how do you define fair and reasonable? What's fair and reasonable to the FBO is not necessarily fair and reasonable to the airport. It's kind of like uh, dealing with an insurance company and what's reason, uh, you know, reasonable and customary, you know, or usual, usual and customary. So everything's open to interpretation when it comes to, to those particular issues. So, but I think it is fair and reasonable more often than not does and should fall into that definition of market rent that I just gave you, where the airport needs to consider all of those use restrictions uh, imposed on the property and, and take into consideration that the rent that a tenant pays has to be mindful of their capital investment, their, the, the limitations, what occurs at the, at the end of the lease, and that it must be used for aeronautical use. And in, in many cases, if it's a, an FBO or a SASO or something of that nature, there are specific minimum standards and restrictions that they must adhere to uh, in accordance with their lease. Uh, so all of those things have to be uh, taken into uh, consideration. The one thing that I will um, state though that, that uh, I'll, I'll kind of disagree with Mr. Coyne in this matter is that, you know, on airport, the, the one thing that is that is the same between on airport and off airport is that when you're dealing with a lease, people on an airport that are that are trying to go out and get financing for a, a leasehold property, they're they're facing the same challenges as somebody off airport that is on a ground lease as well. There are ground leases off airport that uh, that where the tenant faces those same challenges in getting uh, getting funding. So there, there is a commonality. Airports are not the only uh, situation out there where there is a fixed lease term and at the end of the lease, the improvements revert back to, to the property owner. That is st a standard terminology uh, in, in leases, both on and off airport. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's important, and I mentioned about it necessary to be a, a create a win-win situation. Leases are partnerships. I think that's what, what both airports and, and uh, businesses on the airports forget, is that leases are a partnership. And, and that's really what create, kind of creates that win-win situation. But everybody has a stake in the success or failure of, of the business on the airport and the success and failure of the airport itself. So I think it's important that, that everybody goes into a lease negotiation realizing that each, each side has a stake in this and that ultimately there needs to be some shared risk and shared reward uh, through the process of negotiations. 
One of the things that, and Jim addressed this, I think that this is, is probably one of the, the most important issues that, that I do see in, in, with leases and, and lease uh, conflicts is the failure of the airport to learn about and understand their tenant's business and what their business is all about, what their goals and objectives are, what they're trying to do with their business, what their business plan is. I go, air airports uh, do not do a good job of learning about their tenants' activities. At the same time, uh, the tenants on an airport don't tend to, to spend a lot of time learning about the airport and its, and its activities and how the, their, what their goals are, what their plans are. You know, I, what I, I, more often than not, what happens is the only time that an airport tenant attends a, a board meeting or a commission meeting is when they want something. And so it's very important that, that tenants stay involved in the airport, keep, keep up with what's going on at the airport. It's going to create a much better environment when it comes to negotiating lease. Um, you know, I, I think that the one thing that, that, with all due respect, I think the one thing that, that both trade associations do very, very poorly is educate their membership about the uh, about the other side of the of, of the uh, of the fence. Um, I think both trade associations spend way too much time creating an us versus them mentality among their membership as opposed to to working toward um, educating their membership about the other. Um, there, you know, it, it's understandable that, you know, obviously private businesses are looking out for their own, uh, their own benefits, their own economics. Uh, but it, it's important that they they help their airports understand uh, th their challenges because if they can help educate their airports about their challenges, then it will make uh, the the overall process much easier. And the same thing goes for, for the airports as far as, as educating their membership that about what FBOs do and, and what the importance of getting to know the businesses on their airport and what the different dynamics are out there and how that, that needs to be taken in consideration and how that impacts the growth opportunities for the airport. Um, I think the, the focus of a, of, of a lease negotiation it's important that it, it creates, one, it, it provides a fair economic incentive for both sides to thrive. Uh, secondly, it, it, it's important that it doesn't lock either side into a bad deal for a long time, for a long period. You know, Jim talked about 25, 30, maybe 40 years. Um, I think that you know, the problem with that, I mean, it, I think 30 years is kind of the, the industry standard out there. Uh, if, if, if you're going to throw out a number, that probably is kind of the industry standard, and that really does provide, generally provide a, a reasonable period for uh, someone to amortize uh, a debt on that. But you know, more often than not, one of the, one of the hesitancies of the airports is to enter, of entering into long-term agreements is that if they get locked in with a bad tenant, they're stuck with a bad tenant for 30, 40 years. I think that looking at it from that perspective, uh, I think is important in recognizing while while the tenant is looking to get a long-term agreement to to grow their business and amortize their investment, you know, recognizing that you know that most FBOs build their FBOs in order to build something to sell in the future, and so from an airport perspective, they want to they don't want to be locked in with a tenant that may be a bad tenant. Or if they turn around, they're a good tenant, but they sell to a bad tenant. They're, they're locked in for a long period of time as well. So I think there are some uh, some important issues to deal with relative to, to lease term on that. Um, and then finally, I'll just close by saying, as I said, a, a lease must be a win-win situation um, for, for both sides. But unfortunately, sometimes that means that there's got to be some lose-lose on both sides of the uh, both sides of the table as well. So I think it's important for both sides to, to pick their battles wisely and figure out what it is they ultimately want to gain out of a lease negotiation and realize that, that both sides have to get something out of it. So thank you for your time.
Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's clear that um, kind of uh, airport and, and tenant goals that are well-defined uh, and, uh, and aligned in some way um, uh, result in a, a, a you know, more favorable outcome for a potential uh, lease arrangement uh, between the tenant and the airport sponsor. Um, our third panelist today for this session is William Prather. He's been involved in commercial real estate for more than 40 years. Prior to joining LC Full & Wider, Inc., uh, Prather was VP Development for Better Worse Properties, Inc. Uh, with Full Wider, Prather assists in the development of 7,500 acres around Denver International Airport. This uh, project has actually been completed, I believe. And was a partner in the on-site uh, development of Worldport at uh, DIA. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, LC Full & Wider is a 108-year-old privately owned company that was basically just farming and acquired up to <clears throat> 30,000 acres of land in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in northeast uh, metro Denver area. And Denver International landed right smack in the middle of our property, and we wound up selling, I wasn't there at the time, but 40% of DIA to DIA, 15,000 acres of land. That left us with parcels of land literally on all four sides of the airport. And that's been our focus. Uh, I've been with the company about 16 years. You know, we built the Marriott uh, Courtyard Hotel, Frontier Airlines headquarters, an office building. We sell to uh, pads to the various restaurants and hotels that you see at the front entrance to Denver International. And because of that connection with DIA, I got into you know, on-airport development projects. Very different. So my focus here today is, is pretty narrow. I mean, what, uh, that's third-party, multi-tenant development, land side. You know, it's not uh, where we own anything to do with the business. You know, we're real estate guys. We build a, a real estate project. It's leased to multiple different tenants. A good example would be uh, you know, a lot of airports these days are interested in non-aviation revenue generation. It might be trying to use their land that's not for aviation purposes. You know, so we have, uh, I'll give you an example of a retail project that might involve uh, uh, an inline, excuse me, an inline piece of real estate that's chopped up that you would lease to, uh, say, restaurants and other services or companies that would want to service the traveling public. You might have a couple of different pads out on the edges that you would lease to single user uh, outfits, like a, hopefully a national credit restaurant or something, but where they would either build their own building or you would build it for them and lease it to them on a long term lease. So what happens in this thing when you're looking at it from my perspective uh, of that third party real estate development, you know, you put your plan together, you kind of get a handle on the cost, you talk to the airport and those first one or two conversations are usually pretty friendly and, you know, they encourage you to, you know, to, to come out and see if you can make a deal. You put enough together to where you have the basic details, you go to your bank, you outline this to your bank. It's like these gentlemen have talked about, you know, the banker, you know, if you, you know he, he looks at you like you're crazy. And he says, you know, what are you doing with doing this? Do something else. But if you persist, you know, you wind up, I'm going to talk a little bit specific terms here. You wind up that the, the bank right off the bat wants a substantial equity infusion into your deal. 30% say. And your money, of course, gets spent first before that bank ever spends a nickel. You know, then they want to see... Um, a land lease that extends five to ten years longer than the amortization period of your loan. And on an unsubordinated land lease, that's going to be a 20 or 25 year loan, most likely at the best, or at least that's been my experience. So you need a 30 to 35 year land lease. You know, the, the bank wants a debt coverage ratio of 1.25 to 1.4. And what that simply means is that after you've paid all your expenses, they want to see enough revenue to pay that bank 1.4 times. In other words, a big a slush over that thing. Or what you owe them in debt service, they want to see that you're making enough money to really have a comfortable margin. In other words, that they are, are safe. Uh, that, that's kind of standard in the uh, non-airport business too. But typically you'd hit a 1.2, 1.25, a little easier. Then the bank says, well, we want to see pre-leasing. 
Now, when you're doing a, an FBO or other projects, you have that you have that user in hand. But if you're doing a multi-tenant real estate project, you may not. Particularly an inline thing that's chopped up into 1,000 to two or 3,000 square foot uh, spaces. You know, let's say it's a Subway sandwich shop. Uh, you know, that guy doesn't want to commit to a lease from you a year ahead of time. You know, they want to see that building not only under construction, but pretty close so they can get their financing in order and be prepared to do their TI, tenant improvement package. So about your only hope for a pre-leasing thing is going to be that single user, pad user. So you go out and you get a national credit tenant. Let's say ideally uh, at DIA, we were talking to McDonald's. Well, that's wonderful, you know, but McDonald's, those kind of companies can do it either way. They could build their own building and they're pretty good at figuring that out. Or you as a developer could build it to their specifications for them on a long-term lease. Well, if you do that, it's very hard for you, the developer, to make any money on that thing. How are you going to do it? You're going to step up the land lease. You know, DIA's idea of a good time is a dollar and a half a square foot on their dirt. So you want to charge McDonald's, say, 250 Well, those guys are going to take a fairly hard look at that thing. Uh, you know, what do we need you for? Let's go talk to directly to the airport. Ultimately, that's what they should be doing anyway. I'm a firm believer that anytime you put a third-party developer like ourselves in the middle between the airport and the tenant, that tenant's paying more just because there's no other way for you know, the developer who's doing this to make some money. You know, then, as you keep going through this discussion with your bank, then they say, oh, of course, you know, it's going to be a personal guarantee on this loan. You know, oh, yeah, okay, well, okay, you, know, you get over that. But in the standard fashion of, of real estate development these days, you form a limited liability company. The company, that, that entity, with the, only, with the only asset it has is that project, of course signs on the loan. But that's, you know, the bank, that, they don't have much comfort in that, so they want you, Mr. Developer, sign on that loan also. And if you have a few key investors, uh, the bank may very well ask for your investors to sign on the loan also. And that's a joint and several guarantee, meaning each investor is signing a guarantee for the entire amount of the loan. Well, you got to get over that hurdle, uh, you know, and that's sometimes that you can do that. But by now, you are in your full sales mode, convincing people that this deal works, makes sense. Then the bank, you know, gets into the details of the lease. You know, how about a, uh, a you know, a lot of airports, I mean, virtually every airport, requires a relocation provision. You know, I mean, for if there's an aviation need, then they can relocate you. No matter how remote that possibility may be, you know, the bank's underwriters will look at that and say, wow, you know, what, what the hell happens then? You know, so, well, you say, well, you know, the, the airport, we have some compensation from the airport. Well, maybe uh, have, I'm in four deals. I don't have any compensation on any relocation provision in the deals I'm, I'm in. But so how do you do that? And that's an issue with all airports. How do you do that in a fair fashion? You know, is it a straight line depreciation or is it a fair market value? Fair market value, as Mike talked about, you know, you can go you can go down that road all you want, but in the end you have an asset that is decreasing in value every year that goes by on that lease. So okay, so you say you get your bank past that that deal, you know, then they want to see some how do you have any defined escalation language in that land lease defined is it by cpi is it a certain percentage per year do you do it for five years and then do you reset the rate to market that's a big concern airports have that they don't want to get into a long-term deal and be underwater in other words they're bringing a lot of value to that deal and they think they should be paid more and typically in a real estate project uh, you know you can you can pay market so I think you can negotiate this kind of language, you know, to reset these rates uh, periodically. And then you get to the next stage of the, of the loan. Commercial real estate loans, it's not like buying a house. I mean, you're not buying, you, you're not getting a 30-year, 30, 30 25-year fixed-rate mortgage. You know, you have a 25-year amortization period on your loan. At the five-year mark, the bank reopens that deal, reprices the loan. So if interest rates have gone up, your rate's going up. Now, typically, that's on a formula, so it will go down also. But you can imagine in this rate environment we're in right now, it's not likely that rate's going to go down. 
so we're looking at increasing rates in the future. Well, you better have that built into your pro forma. But then even worse, or from my perspective, even worse, the loan is due in 10 years. Now, you don't get a fixed rate deal. If you have a large enough project that you can do some kind of bond financing, now that's good. You have lower rates, you have a, a, and it's fixed. So you're, you're set on the financing side. But in, yet, in, in our kind of deal, in 10 years, the bank calls the loan due. And that's not a repricing, that loan is due. So you're paying it off one way or another. Now, of course, the easiest way is to sit down and negotiate with your, your bank. But they're going to reappraise it. They're going to underwrite that loan from scratch all over again. You're going to pay points. You're going to, it's just like a new loan. And now your lease is 10 years shorter. So now, you know, it just it gets very difficult. So, you know, I, I, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm invested in, uh, personally invested in four deals at different airports. Not one of them do we have a loan on. Not one of them. You know, and I'm a small, I'm a small potato, so I'm, I'm through. You know, I mean, unless we can figure out a way to, to get some reasonable bank financing on that kind of project, you know, my game is over. I'm not doing this again. You know, I, I think about it, uh, I've got a, tw most of my deals are 20 year lease, 20 year leases, 130. So then, then you think about what, well, what happens at the end of the lease? You know, I have no renewal language in any one of these. In a renewal, in, 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 in commercial real estate, I mean, a real renewal means, I mean, it's a real renewal. It's not subject to, it's subject to you as the tenant living up to all the covenants of your lease, for sure. You know, but if you have done that, then you have the option to renew that lease. It's not another negotiation. It may be a reset in the rental rates and that kind of thing, but it's a fixed, real thing. So what we're looking for, or looking at here, is at the end of that lease term, as you know, the, you know, the property is going to revert back to the ownership of the airport. Well, what are they going to do with it? You know, they probably have some somebody in the property's office that think, well, okay, let's go back out and issue an RFP and basically bring in some other people to pay us for the, for the project and keep going. So you as a developer, you're looking at that and finding yourself in the position of, okay, I've, I've planned it, I've financed this thing, I've leased it, I've paid it off, I'm going to give it back to the airport, and then I'm going to go respond to an RFP to buy my own damn building back again. That's where you are on this thing. So anyway, um, just to conclude briefly here, uh, it, it's hard to look at that thing and say, is this really where you should want to devote your capital, your manpower, your credit capacity, and everything it takes to do a, a, a deal on a 20-year lease that is a wasting asset. So everything these gentlemen have talked about of, of working together to put this into a, a fashion that we can, that the airports can work with banks and make it work for them, uh, I think it, it just makes it incredibly difficult to do my kind of thing, a third party multi-tenant. Now if you have a, a, a base business you know, that's driving that thing, then you know, they, that's a different set of dynamics to how to pay that real estate off. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I want to uh, spend some time to open it up for questions to the audience. We have about five minutes, and then uh, we have a session after this on social media. I hope you'll uh, join us for that. So if anybody has any questions for uh, Jim or Michael or Bill, please uh, speak up. We have a mic over here. Ryan, Cutter Aviation. We were talking about uh, leases you know, set up with the airports based on market conditions, based on the operating environment early on in the, in the process, you know, over the term of the 30 years. But what happens when the airport comes in and, and decides that they want to do something different that pretty much competes directly with the private sector? Uh, we have a couple of situations where that's happened recently, uh, where they feel like they can do more and do better uh, for the benefit of the taxpayers and such. What, what mechanisms are in place either through the AC61 standards or through the various you know, other methods uh, to fight against something like that happening and what do, uh, what do tenants have to uh, you know, go to bat with? Well, I think uh, 
I, you, you sat through the presentation on the Part 16, and clearly uh, this is one of the options that the tenants have. I think the most uh, uh, timely example in this is uh, with TAC Air and uh, uh, the Chattanooga Airport, um, and I think most of you are, probably have read about that. Uh, uh, there are a lot of questions that I think policymakers would logically raise in that whole field. Uh, one is, uh, is it a misuse of taxpayers' dollars to go out and build a business to compete with a tenant at that airport? I don't believe that the legislators, uh, either in Congress where I served or in state legislatures, uh, believe that the purpose of AIP grant money or other funds that go to airports is to build a business to compete with an existing business. I, it, it just doesn't seem to me the right use of federal funds in the first place. But even if once it gets done, uh, you know, clearly there's a whole wide range of unlevel playing field questions that you can just obviously answer. When an airport sponsor either owns directly or through a management contract gets economic benefit from one FBO and then that FBO is competing with another FBO that has to get various decisions and privileges from the airport sponsor to do its business. How can that airport treat those two parties equally? It's, a, it's, a, it's just a hopeless, I mean, I, I don't think Solomon could be the airport manager and solve that problem. And so th that is why we've opened up, you know, that why, why TAC Air is following a a Part 16, filing a Part 16 complaint, uh, or planning to. I think uh, the lawyers can tell us exactly where that process is. The airport manager in Chattanooga, of course, has left Chattanooga since this all started. I'm told uh, that when he made his pitch to the airport to do this, they were predicting that this new FBO would sell somewhere around 100,000 gallons a month. Uh, I understand now that they are actually selling between five and $10,000 gallons a month. So the whole, the whole process seems to me to be predicated upon people who didn't know what the business they were getting into was about. And so, so clearly, the laws of supply and demand, the market forces are going to give somebody there a real slap down to begin with. But more importantly, I think if they pursue the Part 16 complaint, I think there will be some very, very serious questions raised, perhaps even beyond the Part 16 cr complaint, because this is, a, this is an issue of potentially uh, an action very much in conflict with a fundamental financing uh, authority of airports of how they can spend their money and on, on what. So it'll be an interesting thing to... For, I don't think it's going to go f much further than this one example. I think the concept of an airport competing with its own FBO is so fraught with risks that I would be surprised if any other airport tries to do it again. Uh, it, it really, to me, is just opening up a, a, a can of worms that is just a, potentially a very big nightmare for any airport sponsor. I'd me, appreciate the FAA to give us an answer as well. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate the complexity of the panel with leases. It seems like, you know, you could have a title called leases, but it really is everything. And, 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 and from our perspective in compliance and now in an ADO, I have, I have parties looking over my shoulder called the Office of Inspector General who don't understand this at all. You That's know. right. So, uh, They're going to get quite an education on it in the next. Uh, well, yeah, uh, but then or I will get an education from them. <laughs> is what's really more likely to happen. But I mean, there's a lot of uh, complexity which I really appreciate. But with regards to the competing FBO, uh, it, FAA policy explicitly recognizes that when an, a local government, a sponsor, competes with an aeronautical business, it must do so in a non-discriminatory basis. So it's recognized, it's conceived of, and your point that that is very difficult is well taken. Hopeless, I don't know, but you know, we, we understand your, your point that the sponsor has to compete as though it is completely on an equal footing. 
The complication to that is that also, too, we say that, I'm going to say it, that the airport can evoke a proprietary exclusive if they do it correctly without contracting with a third party. And then that just sort of tilts the playing field. But that's the way the law is. So, uh, But I, I, I support the notion that this needs to be fleshed without knowing what's going on, but then an allegation that there's a discriminatory or unfair, unlevel playing field in this situation is something that is a, a perfectly legitimate allegation to, subject to Part 16 adjudication. Well, let me let me add something to that relative to um, it, kind of going back to the lease situation. I think, yeah, I am aware of, of several airports that are exploring this same that are following the Chattanooga case with great interest and that are exploring a similar situation at their airports. Probably not airports of the, the size of, of a Chattanooga, but, uh, but they are exploring that opportunity. And generally the driver behind that is kind of back to what we're talking about. They entered in, they have a, a long-term lease with an FBO that is not providing the service levels and in not providing I, I don't, I don't want to get into to the pricing issue because we all know that no matter what the price of fuel is it's always too high if you give it away you know somebody's going to complain that you didn't wash the windshield but without getting it without even being price being an issue it generally comes down to they're concerned about the service levels and the attention to customer service that the incumbent has and they have a long-term lease and there's nothing they can do about it and so they they are looking at all their options to to perhaps go into the fbo business themselves recognizing that they have to to adhere to minimum standards and follow all those things maybe under whether they do it internally or under a management scenario but it's really driven by providing is driven by service it's not dri driven by finances and I think that that really is is another issue. Now, you know, obviously, in the Chattan one of the, the the big issues behind Chattanooga is whether they have used federal funds to finance, you know, and that's a whole different issue. I'm just talking about I'm going to say a scenario where an airport uses their their own reserves to do this. Whether that is well, of course, is, they, you know, there's. I've heard this argument that the the reason the airport wants to do it is because they're not happy with the quality of the performance of the incumbent FBO. Um, the only example I can look at is in Chattanooga. And to my knowledge, uh, not once did the airport go to the incumbent FBO and say, we weren't happy with the level of your service. Uh, not once did they recommend to the FBO that they should do anything differently than what they were doing. In fact, the FBO had only been there for a couple of years and had laid out a lot of plans for some very dramatic new investments and expansion of the facility. And as far as I know, the, that the incumbent FBO got higher ratings in the pilot surveys and the other surveys that you get of an FBO. So, you know, I'm beginning to think that this, this argument that there's, you know, there's a bad tenant out there and we got to fix the problem of a bad tenant. Number one, a landlord has a lot of rights in a lease to ensure that a tenant meets a variety of, of expectations. And if those expectations are not in the lease, to come along and say, oh, it's a bad tenant, look at the lease, what am I not doing that you told me I had to do? And they say, well, you're not smiling enough. Uh, or you're, you know, your paint's not as fresh as it should be. Or your signage isn't as good, or, or whatever. Uh, well, most of that stuff, in my experience, has been based upon really significant personality differences between the uh, FBO and the airport manager. And that's what defines a bad tenant, nine times out of ten, is personality. Uh, and if there's somebody that wants to lay it out for me, what is it about the bad tenant that we don't like? Did he not, then what is he not doing? then discuss it with the FBO and, and, and make those things uh, remediated. But to say you've got a bad tenant and never have brought it to the tenant's attention is to me to, very hypocritical. That's I a think good, that's the case in Chattanooga. That's a good point, Jim. And I think uh, uh, from an airport sponsor point of view, I think a well-defined uh, minimum standards is uh, one way to uh, ensure that uh, you know, you're going to keep yourself away from the bad tenants.